If you're watching this video, then you probably like super tall buildings. I mean, at a first glance, what's not to love? These feats of engineering defy belief, sometimes reaching 24 times higher than they are wide. Things seem to be going great for us super tall building lovers, too. Until the 20th century, the tallest building ever built was the Ulminster Cathedral in Germany at a meager height of 162 meters or 530 feet. Yet today, the Burj Khalifa holds the title at 830 meters, which is over 2,700 feet, and buildings just keep getting taller. In 2000, the average height of the world's 100 tallest buildings was 285 meters, or 935 feet. Well, by 2019, that number was already 385 meters, or 1,263 feet, an increase of nearly 2% every year. But put your sense of awe aside for a moment and ask yourself, is taller or always better? The fact is, the taller the building, the more complex factors the developers have to take into account, and the bigger the chances are that they miscalculate one of them. These factors include engineering problems like foundational stability and wind forces, not to mention safety and economics. Let's review a few case studies that highlight these problems and show why taller isn't always better. Millennium Tower is a defining part of the San Francisco skyline, located downtown at 301 Mission Street in the South of Market District. At 197 meters tall, or 645 feet, it's the tallest residential building in the city and the sixth tallest overall. Its 58 floors provide space for 366 condos, many of which are or have been occupied by famous residents, including Kevin Durant, Joe Montana, and Hunter Pence. When construction was completed in 2009, the skyscraper's late modernist style and sparkling blue glass earned it considerable renown, even prizes like the American Society of Civil Engineers Structural Engineering Project of the Year Award. And that award is a little bit ironic, because Millennium Tower is sinking. That's right, an examination of the structure in 2016 found that the building had already sunk 41 centimeters or 16 inches. That's far beyond the original projection of settling 14 centimeters or 5.5 inches in over 20 years, highlighting one of the reasons taller isn't always better, and that's that stabilizing their foundations is pretty hard work. And what's worse, it's not sinking evenly. The north and west sides of the building have sunk faster than the south and east, resulting in a tilt of 71 centimeters or over two feet by 2022. The problem is foundational. The ground below Millennium Millennium Tower consists of a layer of mud over a layer of colmer sands before reaching the bedrock 60 meters or 200 feet down. Instead of using bearing piles attached to the bedrock, as many other nearby buildings do, the geotechnical engineers from Treadwell and Rollo opted to use 942 concrete friction piles extending about 24 meters or 80 feet into the sand. Still, it's not entirely clear why the piles are sinking deeper into the sand. Some engineers have theorized that other construction projects in the area have removed so much water from the soil that the sand isn't as dense as it was originally. Millennium Street Development, who owns the tower, have also blamed other builders, specifically the city of San Francisco, which began construction on the neighboring Transbay Transit Center in 2011. To do this, they removed old timber piles that have been supporting the Transbay Terminal, uh, which the developers say decreased the pressure on the sands. Naturally, the city does not accept this explanation. In fact, they filed a suit against the developers and various engineering and architectural firms involved in the project. The Homeowners Association did as well, even though both Millennium Street Elements and the City of San Francisco insist the building is perfectly safe to live in, despite the fact that it's sinking and leaning over. However, the residents have the right to be concerned. In 2018, they reported hearing creaking sounds coming from the building early in the morning, followed by a crack found in one of the windows, rated strong enough to withstand hurricane force winds. In March 2023, some of the windows fully broke. In 2020, the lawsuits were settled, and a $100 million project to install full power bearings reaching the bedrock began. It was completed in June 2023. But while Millennium Street development claims that the tower has already straightened out by a quarter of an inch, it's still leaning some 73 centimeters to the northwest. It will take years for the lean to fully disappear if it ever does. In the meantime, San Francisco plans to require any new skyscrapers to rest on piles reaching all the way down to the bedrock. At 555 meters, or over 1,800 feet tall, and hosting 123 above-ground floors, the Lot World Tower in Seoul is the tallest building in South Korea and sixth tallest in the world. Yet reaching those heights was no easy feat, and the story of the tower's construction, which started in 2010 and finished in 2016, is a lesson in the dark side of super-tall buildings 
their human cost. In June 2013, part of the structure collapsed, killing a construction worker and injuring five more. Just a few months later, a pipe exploded, a piece of metal striking a worker in the head and killing him. Just a few months after that, a worker was found dead after falling from the eighth floor while working on a concert hall. Finally, a few months before construction finished, a worker was run over by a truck at the construction site. He died after a week in hospital. It wasn't just workers either. The Lotwell Tower was plagued with accidents and casualties. Pipes, doors, and glass fell on pedestrians. A fire broke out on the 44th floor, and a leaking aquarium closed the ground level wall for five months. In fact, safety was such an issue with the skyscraper's construction that an executive for lot engineering and construction was convicted of involuntary manslaughter in 2016 and given a suspended sentence of eight months in prison. Two other supervisors also received jail terms, and the government fined the company about 15 million won, $13,000, due to what they judged as 109 violations of South Korea's Industrial Safety and Health Act. The many accidents at Lot World Tower may have been some of the most publicized, but they're hardly unique. Constructing super tall buildings has always had a pretty high human cost. Five workers died building the Empire State Building, four building the Burj Khalifa, currently the world's tallest. Even the recent One World Trade Center cost the lives of two construction workers, though that was just a fraction of its predecessor, the original World Trade Center, which finished in 1973 and killed a whopping 60 workers. The structural engineers behind skyscrapers have a lot of responsibility resting on their shoulders. A little bad maths could result in a disaster and the deaths of hundreds or even thousands of people. Some of the most difficult calculations involve how wind forces affect these super tall structures. When William Lemusier designed the Citigroup Center in Midtown Manhattan, wind was an especially important factor due to the tower's unique design, which involves elevation on four offset stilts above ground level. Far from a measly aesthetic choice, the elevated design gives space beneath the building for St. Peter's Lutheran Church. However, this meant the tower, which reaches 279 meters tall or 915 feet and has 59 floors, is more susceptible to strong winds. So, Le Moussier gave the structure chevron braces above the stilts as well as tuned mass dampness capable of reducing mechanical vibrations. Citigroup Center was opened in October 1977, but less than a year later, a structural problem was discovered. In June 1978, a freshman architecture student at the New Jersey Institute of Technology named Leda Carolis contacted Le Musier. Far from criticizing the design, De Carolis asked several questions about the chevron braces and mass dampeners for an introductory paper he was writing, but it was enough to prompt Le Musier to review his calculations. He discovered that with quartering winds, stresses would be 40% higher than it originally thought, enough to topple the building. The engineer retreated to his main summer house to think. Based on the new maths, a wind strong enough to knock over Citigroup Center was due once every 55 years, and if the mass dampener went offline due to a power outage, well, that was every 16 years. He contacted lawyers for Citibank and the Stubbins architectural firm, who decided to reinforce the chevron braces with welded steel plates without notifying the public. Le Moussier passed away in 2007, but his ethical choices during the Citigroup Center engineering crisis have made him one of the most debated engineers in classrooms. Some hail him as a hero for recognizing and addressing his mistake, even though it could have destroyed his career. Others criticize him for failing to inform the public. Either way, it's the perfect example of how super tall buildings require difficult engineering that makes errors more likely. There's no denying Shanghai Tower is an engineering marvel. At 632 meters, or over 2,000 feet, with 128 floors, it's the second tallest building in the world. It also holds the title for the highest observation deck, and it has the fastest elevators in the world when construction finished in 2014. Called Nextway, the system moves a blistering 74 kilometers per hour, or 46 miles an hour, meaning it can reach the top in just 53 seconds. Moreover, the twisting design was championed not only as an aesthetic wonder, but a major environmental innovation, as it's ideal for allowing natural light in and reducing the need for air conditioning. Just one problem. No one wanted to use it. Over two years after its opening, only about a third of its office space was being used, leaving 55 floors entirely empty, visible by large dark bands at night. One issue was that the developers decided to open the building before obtaining all the necessary occupational permits. Another was the building's unique curved architectural design, which made it difficult to use floor space compared to standard rectangular floor plans. This reduced floor efficiency to a mere 50% compared to 70% for most skyscrapers. In reality, though, these factors only exacerbated a problem that 
all super tall buildings face. It's a ton of space dropped on the market all at once. Even in a massive city like Shanghai, is there enough demand for offices to immediately fill 380,000 square meters, which is over 4 million square feet? It takes a long time to find tenants, as you can see with other skyscrapers like One World Trade Center. Though the occupancy rate is currently 95%, it didn't reach 70% until two years after opening. The developers of super tall buildings need patience to see their investments pay off. When it was completed in 2004, Taipei 101 in Taiwan was the tallest building in the world. With 101 floors, it reaches 508 meters, or nearly 1,700 feet. However, the truly amazing thing about this building is its weight. At 700,000 tons, it's 40% heavier than the much taller Burj Khalifa. But all this weight is concentrated on a foundation of just 15,000 square meters, which is about 3.7 acres. This is important because it puts nearly five bars of pressure on the ground beneath Taipei. For reference, that's about 72 pounds per square inch, more than and double the pressure in a standard car tire. The reason the skyscraper is so heavy is that the developers chose to use hybrid structures, incorporating a large amount of concrete compared to the mostly steel frames of other buildings. This was meant to give the building added protection against natural disasters like earthquakes. However, in an ironic twist, Taipei 101's incredible weight may be causing earthquakes. Before construction, the geological area, known as the Taipei Basin, was highly stable, with an average of just one micro-earthquake per year. After construction began, this doubled, and after the building opened, two full earthquakes with magnitude over three occurred directly beneath the structure. It's a mind-blowing reminder of the truth of super tall buildings. They are massive feats of engineering that must take into account a myriad of factors, from wind stresses and foundational support to worker safety and occupancy demand. In fact, these structures are so large and so complex that engineers must take into account their effects on the earth itself to determine if taller really is better. Or maybe it's not.